Right now, from KTAB News, your local election headquarters, this is Big Country Politics. Thanks for being here for this week's edition of Big Country Politics. I'm Victor Sotelo. We start with the latest on COVID-19 here in Abilene and the Big Country. More positive results for coronavirus are adding up around here and across the country. Three company, companies the last week have released information on COVID-19 vaccines, which tests show are more than 90% effective and quick acting. And Taylor County Health officials are working on a plan for distribution. Getting a COVID vaccine is becoming more of a reality. We had prepared originally by buying additional freezers um, for sub-zero. And Annette Lerma, the public health district director for Abilene and Taylor County, says they are working with Moderna and Pfizer on the logistics of a COVID vaccine. But then Pfizer came out and said it was ultra cold. And so we learned that our sub-zero freezers uh, would not work for that. So Lerma had to order new freezers in case they need to host the Pfizer vaccine. But because of the high demand, there's a chance they won't make it in time. So they have to improvise. You've got a plan for getting out 975 doses within a period of five days because that's how long your vaccine is going to be good if you can't keep it at that ultra cold temperature. But the health department is prepared for such a scenario. Back in October, we did a um, pod point of dispensing out at the Shotwell Stadium. We did it with our flu vaccine, but it was in preparation for being able to do a mass vaccination event. And the health department knows just as much as the public when it comes to who will receive the vaccine first. They're going to be the um, health care workers from what we know. They'll be um, at risk populations, which they haven't really drilled down to at risk populations. We're assuming long term care facilities, things like that. But there is a committee to decide who will receive those first rounds and when. Right now, there's about 14 medical facilities who have signed up to become a vaccine administrator. And of course, we would love for as many as possible here locally to kind of take some of the burden off of us. Lerma says there is still time for medical professionals to sign up. In Abilene, with coverage you can count on Marley Capper, KTAB News. The vaccine will be free for all Texans. We'll be talking to Annette Lerma later on in the show. Local public health leaders also discussing the spread of COVID-19 in Abilene schools. KTAB Mercedes Hernandez has a closer look at where experts believe school children are picking up the virus. And here's a hint, it's not from the classroom. Here's your Eye on Education News. A Tuesday meeting among health leaders shared that younger school age children are not catching the coronavirus at the same rate their older peers are. We are continuing to see some outbreaks mainly in high schools and older age. Medical director at the Abilene Taylor County Public Health District, Dr. Annie Drachenberg, also shared that students are not catching the virus in the classroom, but possibly during extracurriculars and during time spent at home. She says canceling those activities would not be an overreaction for schools because it would send a clear message to students about priorities and personal duty during the pandemic. And say, you know, really the goal here was education, having in-person education. The extracurriculars are important too, but let's be very, very careful. Epidemiologist Julia Agawu elaborated that similar action at higher education institutions had a positive impact on outbreaks at Abilene universities. I remember ACU, they had that huge explosion of cases. Talking with them and kind of explaining that some of these extracurricular activities, as much as we want to go back to regular and normal life with masks on, there's still, you know, some things that need to cut, be cut back. Moving forward, the health district encourages schools to improve the COVID culture on their campus to reduce further spread in key city schools. When they see that their school is promoting business as usual, then it's very easy for them to continue in their private lives as business as usual. In Abilene, with coverage you can count on. Mercedes Hernandez, KTAB News. Thank you, Mercedes. And we did reach out to Abilene ISD about the concerns of the possible connection between extracurricular activities and COVID. In a statement, the district mentioned the several actions it has taken, such as reducing spectators at sporting events. The district also said, quote, we are constantly monitoring the situation in our district to determine if we need greater intervention, which could include further reducing spectators. Our goal is to continue to provide extracurricular 
extracurricular activities for our students. End quote. The Abilene School District's full statement is on our website at BigCountryHomePage.com. Now to our eye on Abilene. The West Texas Homeless Network announced this last week that Abilene has achieved what they are calling functional zero homelessness. KTAB's Nanika Hill was there for the announcement and learned what this means for our community. The Abilene, Texas has become the fourth community in the nation to achieve functional end to chronic homelessness. Abilene Mayor Anthony Williams making the big announcement at Mentor Park. But what does chronic homelessness mean? Chronic homelessness is defined as homelessness that exists over a long period of time for an individual or household. Long term meaning homelessness for at least 12 consecutive months or 12 months, four separate instances in a course of three years. You are national leaders. To date, you have sustained an end to chronic homelessness for a year. Rostin Callerman, the coalition coordinator for the West Texas Homeless Network, helping bring several groups together to achieve this goal. I work with a lot of communities across the U.S. Um, that also work in homeless services. We are very blessed to have a mayor that supports the work that we do and wants to be a part of that. And although this is a major accomplishment, the work isn't finished just yet. What's the next mountain that this group has chosen to take on? And it is functional zero for homelessness among youth and families. A task no city in the nation has completed. One definition that's through the McKinney-Vento Act, and that definition includes youth that are staying with friends or couch surfing or are, are otherwise sheltered but just don't have a stable place to stay. Abilene now stepping into uncharted territory to end the fight against homelessness. In Abilene, with coverage you can count on, Danica Hill, KTAB News. And functional zero is defined as three or or less long term homeless cases in our city. The by name list is monitored and maintained by the Abilene Hope Haven. Still to come on Big Country Politics, we talk to Annette Lerma, who is the head of the Abilene Taylor Jones uh, Health Department about the latest with the pandemic here in our area. We're back in two minutes. Big Country Politics on KTAB continues. And welcome back to Big Country Politics. I'm Travis Ruiz, joined right now with Annette Lerma with the Abilene Taylor County Public Health District. Annette, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, thanks for, thanks for having me. I want to talk um, kind of about our current situation, where we stand with COVID-19. So obviously this started in March um, here in Abilene and Taylor County. Where are we right now? Well, we're not where we hoped we would be. Um, we've had a little bit of a protective factor since we're a little more rural than some of the urban areas, but I think that we're really starting to see that even though we're, we're a little bit um, more removed from those larger urban areas, um, we're still experiencing some of the same issues that they're having. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we're not, at least we're not El Paso, at least we're not um, Lubbock and, and the Dallas area and some of those bigger areas that are really struggling having field hospitals uh, brought in and stuff. But I think at the current trend that we're heading down, um, you know, it's not completely out of the question that we would get there. So I think that it's time for us to really take a hard look at everything that we're doing, make sure that we're each doing our part to be as careful as we can, because we don't want to see those hospitalizations continue to rise, which is the boat that we're in now. So, is this kind of what, what we're describing as the third surge? Is that, is that what we're describing this as? Yeah, I think it depends on who you ask as to how many surges that we've had. But as far as significant surges, we would probably classify this as the, that third big wave. Um, and what are we seeing as far as, you know, new cases? We're seeing, you know, more than 100 almost every single day um, here in the county. Uh, what are we seeing? Um, you know, are, are these communities spread? Are they from people um, within their own family or they came in direct contact? What are we seeing? Yeah, I think that a, a good portion of them um, 
probably about half, and I'll, I'll look at my notes really quick here to see. Um, our EPI team gives us a breakdown each week from the cases that have been investigated. Um, and I was trying to look here because I think she had put um, how many were associated with um, household. So 40% were uh, contact with a household member, and then 60% were of a non-household contact. Um, so, you know, obviously there's lots of community spread, but it's also the people that we know that we're in contact with. A good portion of those, you know, it's your, it's your friends, it's the people at school that our kiddos are hanging out with. Um, it's our social circle that's making us sick. So, you know, some of that, 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 that advice that you guys are giving out, that the, the same message um, that we've had since March, right? You know, washing hands, social distance, wearing your mask, those things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the hardest part about it, like I just said, with it being our friends and family, that's getting us sick most of the time. I mean, we're all going out and doing the things that we need to do, grocery shopping and get food and um, go to the doctor and things like that. Those are things, go to work. Those are things we all have to do every day. Um, but when you look at where we're seeing the majority of cases, it's continuing to socialize in our, our circle of friends. And so rethinking that, um, pressing the pause button on getting together with other friends. Um, but if you do, being safe about it, continuing to wear your mask, even though it feels really weird to be uh, wearing a mask when you're in your social circle. Uh, but those are things that are really going to help protect us. And consider, you know, like I said, just pressing pause on those things and um, we're trying to get to the point where we have a vaccine and we see it on the horizon. We know that it's coming soon. Um, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so everybody holding back a little bit on all of those social events that we want to do um, just to make it to the vaccine and get on the other side of that where we can get the majority of our people immunized uh, which we anticipate will be sometime maybe in the summer, maybe spring, summer of next year, when a good majority of the population will be able to be immunized. And talking about that vaccine, it, it's pretty amazing. The efficacy rates that we're seeing with this new vaccine um, are very high. And you guys have already been working on lots of plans from storage, um, to distribution, all these sorts of plans are things that you guys are already working on, right? Yes, we're talking about these things every day. We're attending conference calls with the state and with the Texas Department of Emergency Management just to plan all of those details. But we're very encouraged because you know, originally when they were developing the vaccine, we had heard early numbers saying 60 to 70 percent efficacy. And so we were all kind of prepared for, well, it's not as good as we would like. Um, so when they came out with 90% and 94, uh, close to 95%, I think that everyone feels a lot more encouraged about what this vaccine will do to kind of restore our way of life that we had before COVID. All right, and at Lerma, we're gonna return to talk with you in just a moment, and we're gonna talk about that up upcoming Thanksgiving holiday and some preparations that you need to make. We'll be right back. Big Country Politics on KTAB continues. Welcome back to Big Country Politics. Joined with Annette Lerma with the Taylor County Abilene Public Health District. And I want to talk about Thanksgiving. So obviously Thanksgiving on the horizon, Christmas on the horizon. These are times when people get together with their family, Friendsgiving, with their close friends, those sorts of things. What's the advice uh, that you guys are, are, are giving out? Well, we're just encouraging everybody to start planning. Um, it's got to look different this year for everybody. I think we all have to do our part to do something differently. Um, so the CDC is encouraging people not to travel this year, stay, uh, stay at home, but gather with members of your household. Um, 
those people that you are normally around anyway is the safest thing to do. If you can host an event outdoors, hopefully we'll have really great weather. It looks like we're going to have very pleasant weather. Um, so setting a table up outside and encouraging more outdoor activities. Um, but even just if you're in the house, opening your windows and doors, allowing that airflow to go through so you don't have stale stagnant air kind of hanging around um, is going to add a little bit of a, a protective factor. Um, putting someone in charge of serving the food um, instead of setting up the food all along the counter and having everybody come by and serve their own, uh, maybe putting someone in charge of serving that. They've washed their hands, they're wearing gloves, they're wearing a mask, they're serving um, the plates and dispersing and um, like I said, trying to eat outside or, or space out. Um, shortening the length of your visit, you know, maybe just getting together for a short period of time. Um, but one of the things that we're encouraging and, and what we're doing with my own parents who are elderly um, and in poor health, we're just gonna zoom them in. So, you know, we're gonna have them at the table on the computer we've got mom and dad set up with zoom and everything is ready to go and we've tested it we'll drop off a plate to them um go back home bring them up on zoom zoom and they can still you know eat with us and talk we're going to do the same thing with christmas we'll go drop off presents and then we'll zoom them in um, so that we can still connect with them and gather but they are not at risk um, so you want to be real careful especially with your elderly family members or anybody who is medically fragile um, has underlying health conditions and that can mean a lot of things it can mean diabetes it can mean obesity um, any kind of, of um, health condition that puts your immune system at, at, at risk you really want to be careful gathering with those people um, in larger groups so just being mindful of all of that and planning ahead and being willing to do something a little bit different this year. And it's hard. Um, you it know, is. these are our family, our close friends, you know, we want to hug them. We want to be with them without masks. It's hard, right? It's really hard. And I know that we've all been struggling. Our mental health is, is really struggling for all of us. I think even if you don't typically struggle with mental health issues, I think it to some degree, we're all struggling with that. And that's a very important part of physical health as well. So every family needs to really evaluate um, the pros and cons of the decisions that you're making. Uh, find a way to connect even if you're not going to connect physically, find a way to connect with those that you love. Um, do friends giving by zoom, uh, you can, it's not ideal, but you can still make it fun and you can still visit and connect socially. All right. Um, next, I want to talk about the health district. So um, you guys are, are working hard, still doing a lot of tracing, a, a lot of uh, different work, and you guys are having to increase your staff, right? We are. So we've had uh, about 10 contact tracers on staff and then, of course, just normal staff working on that. We've borrowed library staff. I think we're up to about 10, using about 10 of the library staff that are borrowed. Um, library staff is doing a lot of uh, data entry, but with this latest surge, we quickly found that we were not, didn't have enough staff on board. Um, so we've recently brought on an additional 15 people. Some of those are contact tracers and some of those are data entry people. Um, and we're just trying to keep up with the contact tracing. We've recently taken um, our environmental health staff off of routine restaurant inspections and they're helping out with um, an initial call that's going out as soon as we receive a report of a positive case, they're making that initial call not to do the full epi investigation, but just to get people information, telling them how to quarantine uh, or how to isolate uh, since they're sick. We're sending them an email that gives our care guide that tells them specific directions and gives them important numbers and information, directs them to our website. Um, but we're also asking them to contact their own primary contacts. So everybody that they've been in contact with in that 48-hour window prior to their symptoms starting, 
these are, these are, like I said, they're in your social circle. You've got their phone number. Um, they'll answer your call for sure. And so we're just asking them to uh, give them a heads up and say, you know, hey, it's recommended that you quarantine for 14 days. Here's some more information. Um, just to try to isolate those cases quicker um, because we are backlogged and we want to make sure that we're getting to them quickly so they have the information they need to keep themselves and their family members and their community safe. So it sounds like you guys are really having to prioritize. So you mentioned you guys took off the, the routine uh, health, health uh, I, what are they called? Health? Restaurant, the restaurant inspections. The restaurant inspection. So um, that staff is having to be repurposed and reprioritized to another area, right? Right, which that's what we've continued to do throughout this whole time is we'll hire more staff and that will allow other staff to go back to their routine jobs. But as it picks up, you know, we are constantly pulling people off of their normal duties and saying, you know, today we need you to do this. Um, so everybody within public health, no matter what your job is, at some point you are either making calls, you're um, doing some legwork. Um, you I think people don't realize how much is involved. And when you get a, a lab report, it may not come with all the information you need to be able to put it into our system and, and report it. And so you've got people who've got to call lab sites. Um, you've got people have to, who have to call the patients themselves to get further information. Um, and just trying to track down information is, is a lot of work. Most definitely. All right, Annette Larma, thank you so much for your time and all the work that you guys have been doing within the healthcare community. I, I know, um, you know, the healthcare community is on the front line. So thank you for everything. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate it. Big Country Politics on KTAB continues. And that does it for this week's edition of Big Country Politics. For the latest uh, in political headlines, always go to bigcountryhomepage.com, and we'll see you next week, same time, same place. Thanks for watching.